So laptops are a very personal thing. Everyone has their preference on what they like, on the size, on the weight, on the aspect ratio, and on the features of each laptop. What is sure? Chances are, if you can get the same performance, the same battery life, and about the same display size, but in a lighter, smaller form factor chassis, chances are you're not gonna say no. And that's why Tuxedo has replaced their Stellaris 15 laptop and their Infinity Book Pro 16 with a dedicated GPU with the Stellaris 15 Slim, which has the same internals as the previous gen of Stellaris with their latest iteration, but with a smaller and lighter chassis. So let's take a look at what this thing can do and also at why it's very likely to be the next laptop I buy when I actually need an upgrade. We'll also compare it with the Stellaris 15 that I own just to see how the size has evolved. Now the usual disclaimer, Tuxedo does sponsor a fair few videos on the channel but they never sponsor hardware reviews either for their hardware or for their competitors. So this here is a review unit, I have to send it back afterwards and I wasn't paid to make this video. So now let's talk aesthetics and build quality. I absolutely love how this laptop looks. It is matte black, it's made entirely out of aluminium, and it houses a 15.3 inches display, which I can't really tell the difference with the usual 15.6, but compared to a usual 15 inch laptop, this one feels much, much smaller, mostly because there are no bezels around anything really. The keyboard is almost edge to edge, the display has very minimal bezels, apart from where the webcam is housed. The space is really optimized here. In terms of dimensions, we're talking 34 centimeters of width, 2.2 centimeters in height at its highest point, and 24.5 centimeters in depth for a total weight of 2.1 kilos. Compared to the previous Stellaris 15 that wasn't the slim and was a 16 by 9 aspect ratio, the 16 by 10 one is as tall, not taller, but it's less wide. And with those tiny bezels, it kind of feels like a 14 inch, but with the display turned on, it's the kind of exact same screen size. This also doesn't translate in compromises in the design. The laptop looks really good with a little edge or lip at the back where the ports are housed, meaning the display hinges don't start at the very back of the laptop, which is probably good if you drop the laptop because the hinges aren't what are going to take the brunt of the shock. There are still a few compromises in terms of the keyboard itself, which we'll talk about at the end of the video. As usual, the branding is very, very light on Tuxedo computers. You have the usual Tuxedo logo laser etched on the lid of the laptop. You can obviously have whatever logo engraved here if you want to change that, like I did on my own Stellaris 15. And you also have a Tux branded super key instead of a Windows key. As per the build quality, the laptop is the usual fare for aluminium it feels really good when resting your palms on it, it feels solid, it doesn't bend, it has very little flex, apart from the middle of the keyboard. It's a really, really solidly built computer. Now the daily workhorse laptop that I use to make all of this content is made out of magnesium, which isn't a bad material, but compared to aluminium, it just doesn't feel as good. Aluminium is more solid, it's more scratch resistant, it is a bit heavier, but in general, it just gives that premium feeling to a laptop, which I didn't know I missed, but I do. I really, really like this Stellaris Slim 15 design. Now, this doesn't matter if the performance isn't good though. So the Stellaris Slim packs either an AMD Ryzen 7 8845HS or an Intel Core i7-14650HX. I have the AMD model here, so that's what I will be testing. Do note that the Intel model can also have a Core i9-14900HX. So in Geekbench 6, the AMD CPU reached 2614 in single core and 12686 in multi core, which soundly beats the 13th gen Intel Core i7 that I have in my daily workhorse laptop. Uh, this CPU reaches 2507 in single core and 9976 in multi core. This CPU is coupled with an NVIDIA GPU. No matter if you decide to go the Intel or the AMD route, you have an NVIDIA RTX 4060 
or a 4070 if you prefer that. Now, I can already hear the sounds of tens of comments saying some form of NVIDIA bad, but before you rush to your keyboards, just know that this is not really the case anymore. Sure, older GTX and early RTX cards are problematic, even with NVIDIA's official drivers. But RTX 3000, 4000 GPUs, they work perfectly, even under Wayland, with the latest NVIDIA drivers. I've been using them for a while, I don't have a problem. I run everything on Wayland, there is virtually no issue whatsoever. Now, of course, I ran a few game benchmarks like Horizon Zero Dawn and Shadow of the Tomb Raider on that RTX 4060 that the test laptop I got has. And here are the results. All the tests are performed at the native resolution 2560 by 1600 without any upscaling under a Wayland session, so with X Wayland. For Shadow of the Tomb Raider, at the maximum settings, the game reached 94 FPS on average, so ultra settings, native resolution. Lowering details down to medium, it reached 106 FPS. For Horizon Zero Dawn, on the ultra settings, then the game reached 53 FPS on average at the native resolution, and if I dropped it down to medium details, it went up to 71 FPS. And yes, you'll see it reports the OS as being Windows, that's because the game is run using Proton, and it doesn't detect it's using Linux, so it's writing that it's running on Windows 10. Now you might wonder why I tested medium graphics, and this is because the display can go up to 240 hertz uh, refresh rate, meaning that you might want at some point to lower the details or the resolution to try and hit at least 120 FPS in certain games, because the display is capable of doing that. Now as per battery life, this Stellaris Slim 15 has a 99 watt hour battery, meaning it's rated for up to 13 hours of battery life, but in real life testing on hybrid mode, meaning the integrated GPU was used mostly, but the Nvidia GPU could wake up when needed, I got a tiny bit under 7 hours and 30 minutes of looped video playback on YouTube uh, in Firefox at mid brightness over Wi-Fi on Wayland still. With just office related tasks, you can get about an hour more. And of course, if you lower the refresh rate to 60 Hz, you're going to get even more. Although this display supports adaptive sync, so variable refresh rate, and on Tuxedo OS, the default distro, you have Plasma, which has support for variable refresh rate. So maybe you don't really need to lower that refresh rate, but you can still cap it at 60, so it never goes up to 240 hertz and it never uses more battery life than you're willing to. In terms of noise, it is a pretty quiet laptop, even under load. It's not going to make noise that fills the entire room, you will still hear the fan spinning when you're gaming for example, but it's not as loud as other models I've used in the past. Now let's talk about the ports. This laptop offers a lot. Uh, on the left side, you have one USB-A 3.2 Gen 1 port and one USB-C 3.2 Gen 1, plus an audio jack. On the right side, you have an SD card slot and two USB-A 3.2 Gen 1 ports as well. On the back, you have a mini DisplayPort 1.4, which is hardwired to the dedicated NVIDIA GPU and supports G-Sync. It's likely the port you want to use to output a game to an external display. You have a USB-C 3.2 Gen 2 port, hardwired to the integrated GPU, meaning the AMD one on my test laptop, and this port also supports charging the laptop. There's also an HDMI 2.1 port that connects to the NVIDIA GPU and also supports G-Sync, plus a 2.5 gigs Ethernet port and the usual barrel charger. Now the Intel model replaces that regular USB-C port at the back with a Thunderbolt 4 port, which will give you faster transfer speeds. Uh, and it also supports like the same features, charging, HDMI, whatever else uh, you like from USB-C ports. As per the display, it's 16 by 10, 15.3 inches at a resolution of 2560 by 1600. It supports 240 Hertz or 60 Hertz, and it's an LED display. It supports adaptive sync, it has a brightness of 500 nits and a contrast ratio of 1000 to 1. It also supports 100% of sRGB. 
The viewing angles are really good as with virtually all the tuxedo laptops I've ever tried. It's a really good panel. You can open the display all the way down to about 180 degrees and that display really doesn't wobble much. The hinges feel very solid. For once, uh, the hinge uh, caps are not plastic, but they're aluminium, meaning the hinge covers have far less chance of popping off or breaking after a few falls or after a few years compared to a plastic laptop. The bezel around the display are minimal and you have the usual webcams, a full HD 1080p one that can record at 30 FPS. It's not too potato quality, but it's also not great. Now, at least with the pre-installed Tuxedo Control Center on Tuxedo OS, you will have the options to tweak how the image looks to be less overexposed or underexposed, but it's still a webcam from a laptop. The result will be a bit worse than what you're seeing right now, which is also captured uh, on the webcam, but on a Logitech 4K Brio, which isn't as good as what I had with my previous camera, but I'm still figuring things out in the new apartment. The speakers though aren't bad. They have some amount of bass, they do not peak or vibrate the chassis of the Stellaris Slim 15, and they sound pretty crisp to me. They're really solid. And to conclude, we have the keyboard. This is the only area where I feel the more compact form factor led to a compromise. Well, the cooling and performance and display are really fantastic, the keyboard feels a bit cramped. Most of the keys are full size, uh, the function keys are a bit small, but the normal letters and numbers are the normal size, uh, even though this is a German layout that I just cannot get used to. Where things miss the mark for me is with the numpad. It is really compressed with, I would say, about two-third width keys, and this makes it relatively unreliable, in my opinion. You can easily press two numbers instead of one if you try and go fast. Now, this is probably something you get used to over time, but personally, I don't feel comfortable with this numpad. I always hit two numbers at the same time. Maybe after a month of use, you get used to it. But right now, I would probably prefer if it wasn't here at all and the keyboard and touchpad were fully centered on the device uh, because right now it's more of an inconvenience. But I guess some people will just prefer having a weird compressed numpad than no numpad at all. Apart from that, though, it is a very nice membrane keyboard with a chiclet style. The keys actuate well, they're stable, you can hit the key at an angle or from a side or a corner, the hit will still register, the keys bounce back quickly, they are easy to target, the sound will also not drive your colleagues to madness if you use this laptop around other people, which is always better than your standard mechanical keyboard. Now seriously, if you use a mechanical keyboard without quiet switches in an open office, you deserve to have your hands stapled to your head. As per the touchpad, it's glass, it's extremely smooth, and while it is still a dive board mechanism, so you need to press on the bottom half of this thing to click, it's really, really good. Gestures on Wayland and on Plasma feel really great with this, super smooth, the click feels solid, the sound of the click is good as well. It is a great touchpad for any kind of laptop, PCs or Macs. Now finally, let's look at the various configurations you can get this device in. So we already mentioned you can get it with an Intel CPU or an AMD CPU. The base AMD model, which is the one I reviewed, with 16 gigs of RAM, the RTX 4060, and 500 gigs of PCI3 SSD, comes at a bit less than 1700 euros, including the usual 20% European German VAT. So it's like 1400 euros without taxes. You also get Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.3 with that. You can of course spec it up with up to 96 gigs of RAM and up to 8 terabytes of PCIe 4 storage. And you can choose whatever keyboard layout you like. It's still limited to ISO layouts as far as I can tell. Uh, Tuxedo has said they wanted to expand to ANSI keyboards, but right now it's just ISOs at least on this model. The Intel model is more expensive starting at 1740 euros, so 1450 without taxes, and in both cases, of course, moving to the RTX 4070 will cost you a bit extra and you have the extra option for the Intel model to go to an i9 instead of the i7. 
Now this is a fantastic laptop. The minute my current Infinity Book Pro 16 with Nvidia GPU dies, this is probably the model I'm going for. I like Tuxedo computers, they provide really good laptops, I never had any issues with them, they always work reliably, they have good performance, so I'm gonna keep buying from them because I have never been let down by any of the products that I got from them, which is, uh, I think, three computers right now, a desktop and two different laptops. This one has the form factor I want, a bit smaller and a bit lighter than my Infinity Book Pro 16, which is nice because now I give uh, lessons at a business school, so I do need to carry around my laptop more. It doesn't stay plugged all the time, so I like having a smaller form factor, but the performance, the ports, everything is there to accomplish everything that I need to do. So yeah, probably gonna be my next laptop as soon as this one dies, which hopefully isn't too soon. Anyway, as usual, if you need a Linux laptop, I left a link to this device and the general Tuxedo website, even though this is not sponsored, at least you can check on the specs yourself on their website. And if you enjoyed the video, all the usual niceties are underneath this video, click all those usual buttons, uh, you know how things work. And if you really enjoy the channel, there are plenty of links in the description as well to help support it and get some pretty cool perks. So, thanks for watching and I guess you will see me in the next one. Bye!